two o'clock, so let's go ahead and get started. I'm gonna be very respectful of your time as I know you guys are all super busy. Um, thank you guys all for joining us today. I'm so happy you can be here and I'm really, really excited about this particular seminar. I think there's a lot that can be taken out of this. My name is Jennifer. I'm from the Maine Small Business Development Centers. Um, the Maine SBDC provides no cost confidential business advising and training like this to business owners just like yourselves throughout the state of Maine. Um, let me see here. There is a chat feature at the bottom of your screen, so feel free to use that chat to submit any questions you have. There's also a Q&A. You're welcome to use that as well. Um, we'll we're going to try to get to all of those questions, if not during the seminar, definitely at the end, so hang in. Um, we're going to try to answer every single question you guys submit. Um, this is being recorded, and I will send out the recording and the slides at the end of the presentation or at the end of, uh, I'm sorry, at, in, the, in a follow-up email later today or tomorrow, um, late in the day apparently. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Richard Billetto, who works at the University of Southern Maine. He is a close partner of the SBDC and I'm so, so glad and thankful that he could be here to present to you guys all today. So turn, take it away. Thank you, Jennifer. So welcome everyone. Today we're going to talk about 15 things you should be thinking about doing to improve your overall online marketing and website strategy. Uh, my name again is Richard Billadu. I teach in the School of Business at USM. Uh, after today, if you have any questions for me that we don't answer during the webcast, please feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, you'll find my email address on this slide, as well as on the contact slide that is the last slide of the presentation. So I'm glad to answer questions after today if any come up. And if you're interested in learning more about my academic or professional interest, I've also included a link to my page on USM's website. So although I'm talking today about digital marketing, uh, my overall areas of expertise are marketing strategy, new product development, uh, entrepreneurship, and business creation. So please, if at any point you wanna be in touch, let's be in touch. So we are gonna run through 15 concepts that I think are important to improve your overall website as well as your overall online or digital marketing strategy. And the first one is Google Analytics. You wanna make sure that you've registered to use Google Analytics. First of all, it's free, which is fantastic because there's a lot of power. If you're not familiar with Google Analytics, it's a tool that basically gives you insight into how your website and your overall online marketing strategy is performing. So you can find information on paid advertising, if you do paid advertising, on search. So you can see how visible your website is and what words or phrases people are using to find it. If you're using video, you can see how that video is performing. And if you're using social media, you can see how that social media is building your overall web audience. So I've included a link to Google Analytics in this presentation so that if you are not currently using it, you can sign up to use it. Regardless of how large or small your website is, everyone should have some sense of how that website's performing. And Google Analytics is a wonderful tool to tell you how the website's doing. The other thing that I love about Google Analytics is they have so many free online training modules. So if you don't know where to get started, there's a great module for getting started. If you already have analytics data that you've been reviewing over a period of time, there are wonderful modules on how you can do A-B split tests and other things that can enhance your overall website performance. So Google Analytics is great, regardless of if you're a novice or an expert. And so the first question I would have you ask yourself when you're looking at your website is, are you signed up for Google Analytics? If the answer is yes, great. If the answer is no, you should try to sign up today because it's a very powerful tool. Next up, I want to talk a little bit about metrics. So there's an old saying in business, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And one of the things that I find often in my consulting practice when 
a startup business comes to me and they say, we don't know how we're doing online, my first question is, what metrics are you evaluating? And in about 50% of the cases, the answer is none. So although that's not an ideal answer, the good news is anyone can start evaluating metrics. So when I say metrics, I mean, if you're a novice, picking one or two things that you can track over time. Maybe it's the length of time a visitor spends on your website. Maybe it's a sign-up rate where you're trying to collect people's email addresses and you can see over time how people are signing up and if you're growing that number or if it's shrinking. Maybe it's some conversion metric like sales because you're selling something online. Maybe you're a restaurant and you take reservations online. So one of the metrics you track over time are the number of people who make a reservation versus the number of people who visit the website. So there are so many numbers that we can choose from to track. The important thing is to pick a few, one or two that are gonna be meaningful to you and track them over time. Because when we evaluate our performance over time, it allows us to get a sense of the things we're doing that are working versus the things that are not working. It also helps us if there's been a shift in the marketplace. There may be something in the economy that changes consumer behavior. There may be a circumstance like the COVID-19 pandemic that really changed people's online behavior. So if we track our metrics over time, we know what the baseline is so that when we have an economic downturn or we're seeing how we're recovering from the pandemic, it allows us to get a sense of what consumers are doing. So metrics and analytics are at the heart of online success. One thing I do want to say, if you're just starting out with metrics, a lot of people think metrics are about math. The good news is Google Analytics does all the calculations for you. So you don't really have to worry about doing much math. But you do want to be thoughtful in defining and choosing the metric that you're going to track over time. And I don't want you to think that the metrics that you're working with today will be the same ones over time. As your business grows and evolves and you gain a better understanding of consumer behavior, you may change the metrics that you evaluate. So we need to remember that one of the tenets of successful web strategy is testing and iteration. So we always want to be trying new things, even if they're small things, changing the color of a buy button, changing font size, incorporating a video on an important product by decision page. All of these types of things can have a great impact. And one of the things that I love most about the digital space it's very easy to make these changes. When we think about making a television ad and we think about the more conventional ways in which we advertise and promote, it's very expensive to make something that's on television. And that ad often needs to endure for a period of time. So if we make a bad ad, we're stuck with it or we have the huge expense of redoing it. Online, if we develop a page on our website and we don't like the way it performs, we can build another page. And so we have a lot of flexibility in how we can use this tool. Another thing that I want you to remember is everything we do online should be based in what our customers want. You know, one of the biggest challenges when I evaluate small business websites, often the owners and managers of small businesses go, well, here's what I like. And so I put all the things that I like on my website. Well, that will work if at the end of the day, all of your customers are just like you. But for most of us, the reality is our customers are not just like us. And so we end up preaching to many different audiences and therefore we have to understand what customers need and want. So sort of my next question to ask yourself, are you already evaluating one or two key metrics to track site performance over time? If you are, great, keep on doing it. If you're not, consider if you could do it today. So let's talk about the third concept, asking your customers. So the ultimate rule, you always wanna ask your customers if your content works for them. A website is about the customer experience. And so again, you might think, I have this small shop and so I'm trying to create content about the things that I sell, but your customers might need information about who you are before they would ever make a purchase. 
So it's really important to know what content is important to customers. Again, we can use a bunch of metrics that come right out of Google Analytics to see how things are going. We might see how long people are spending on our website. We might look at how many opt-in. We might look again at conversion, how many people are buying relative to the number of people visiting. And then there are two other metrics that I'll just mention. One is bounce rate. And this is a measure of how many people come to your site and leave within seven seconds. So people come and they leave almost immediately. One of the things that's interesting about bounce rate, you can actually look at how many people leave immediately versus the number of people who leave within that seven second window. But one of the things we've discovered is you only have about seven seconds to make an impression on someone when they visit your website for them to determine if the site is for them or not. So customers very quickly decide if they're gonna stay on the site or they're gonna go someplace else. And so we need to make sure that we're making a good first impression. One of the best ways to know that is to ask your customers. So find a group that you can reach out to and engage them to get their opinions. Another thing is this process I like to call initiate, iterate, and integrate. So in initiate, we do some sort of experiment we change our email sign up. And so we put that out there as a test and we see how consumers respond to it. Once we understand the response, let's say the sign up is complex and all of a sudden a lot fewer people are signing up for our online newsletter, then we gotta iterate. We gotta do some additional testing because our goal was to improve sign up, not inhibit sign up. So then once we've iterated and we find something that works, we then integrate it and expand it across our entire website. So a third concept for you to think about, are you surveying your customers frequently to understand their needs and also to understand their thinking and opinions of your website? Now, as we know, whenever we go out and ask our customers, one of the things we have to commit to is using that feedback. So customers that are surveyed over and over again, but then they see no changes on your website, they get fatigued and then they're not gonna give you their opinions anymore. So if you're not in a position right now to be able to act on the feedback, then you might wanna wait or decrease the frequency of surveying. But as a general rule of thumb, I own two businesses myself and one of them we survey our customers every month and then the other one we survey our customers once a quarter. So those are the frequencies that have become meaningful for us to gather feedback to allow us to take some sort of action to change some part of our website. Fourth concept, be locally visible. You wanna make sure it's easy for your site to be found in local search. And Google has this wonderful feature called My Business Profile. If you're not familiar with My Business Profile, there's a link to it in these presentation slides. And what I want everyone to do is go and claim your website on my business profile and make sure your profile is up to date. One of the things we learned in the pandemic as we were starting to reopen the economy, many people did not update their hours of operation, which frustrated many customers. In fact, almost 75% of hours of operation were out of date when we were trying to reopen the economy. When consumers get frustrated, they're not gonna come back and check to see when you're open, they're just gonna go someplace else. And so one of the best things we can do is make sure Google has the most current information about our business and we can control this. The downside is if we don't control it, let's just say we rely on Google and its search bots to pull this information and assemble it, then it often is incorrect. I will give you an example. One of the ways in which Google loves to get hours of operation, if you haven't updated them, is by going through and searching user reviews. Well, many times customers get your hours of operation totally wrong. And so you wanna be in control of this information. And the good news is you can control all of it. Again, like Google Analytics, this is a free tool to use. You just click this link, you go and you claim your website and you build your business profile around it. And if all this information is current and up to date, it allows people when they're visiting the market, people who reside there, but also people who are visiting there, 
to really have current information about your hours of operation and about other things like how to get in touch with you. So important to do. I want to talk a little bit about this thing called EAT or expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. Any of you who have been doing search engine optimization for a long time know that over time Google has changed the algorithm that it uses to determine where it's going to place you in search. If you're not familiar with Google algorithm, basically you go to Google and you type in a term. Let's say we type in coffee shop and then we hit go. Well, Google uses a sophisticated algorithm to figure out which websites it should serve to me sitting here in Portland, Maine, related to coffee shops. So in the old days of search engine optimization, this was based on a lot of things we did as a business. So we had to provide data around keywords that we wanted to be found, and those had to match up with our content. And we took a whole bunch of actions to try to send the signal to Google that we were in fact being good businesses and here are all the ways we wanted to be found. Now, interestingly, Google over time has evolved this algorithm. And as part of the algorithm, Google is now trying to determine how to make the results it serves to users more useful to users. So it's looking at the way in which users and customers respond to our website. Do they stick around? Do they visit more than one page? Do they have an easy time navigating? Do we have a low bounce rate? Do they provide us with a rating and review? Do they talk about us in social media? Do they send a link to our website and an email they send to a friend? All of these are ways for us to establish our expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. So what Google is essentially saying is business, you do things to show me that you're being a good business and I'll reward you but I'm gonna reward you more if others think you're an expert, you have some authority or you're trustworthy. So linking back and forth to other businesses can become important. For example, if you join the Chamber of Commerce, having some reciprocal linking between you and the Chamber of Commerce sends a signal to Google that you actually have expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. Joining the Better Business Bureau and putting the icon on the bottom of your website and linking to the Better Business Bureau is another way to help establish this thing that we call EAT. So when we look at the five golden rules of expertise, authority, and trustworthiness, you gotta have relevant content. If you are a restaurant, and you have eight pages on bird watching on your website, Google is not gonna think your website is very relevant. They're gonna look at the type of business you are and they want to make sure that you have content that matches up with that type of business. So very important. Second one, you wanna make sure you have an easy to find contact us and about us page. There was a recent audit done by the Digital Marketing Association of America, and one of the things they found in 35% of cases, it was not easy to get in touch with a business. They had buried the contact us link. Now, when you do that, if users can't find the contact us link, you can be certain that the Google bot that's searching your site also can't find it. And what Google thinks is if you don't have a visible contacts us page, they think you don't want people to get in touch with you and therefore they don't think you're a legitimate website. So you wanna make sure you have a really clear contact us page and about us page. You also wanna make sure you have ratings and reviews. And a little bit later on, we're gonna talk about the value of ratings and reviews. They don't all need to be good, but we do have to have a process to think about how we handle them. You also want to connect logically to social media. Most consumers now think about social media presence as one of the ways in which they support the relationship they have with your brand. So one of the things that's interesting, if you have an active presence in social media, this increases the likelihood that your customers will be brand loyal by about 80%. So you got to figure out how you use social media. Now, one thing, and we're going to talk about social media in just a few minutes, it can be a time sink. So you want to do just enough 
to get the value of social media, but you won't want to do so much that it's the only thing you have time for. And then lastly, a linking strategy. How can you get others to think about linking to you? And how can you also link out to credible sites like the Better Business Bureau or others? So question in this case, have you reviewed your expertise, authority, and trustworthiness? And one hint, you should also be talking to your users or customers about this asking them if they actually think you're an expert, you're trustworthy, et cetera. You wanna be able to engage with your users. So whenever someone visits your site, you gotta find a way to engage with them. That might be email capture. Maybe you ask people to create a profile. Maybe you give them some free premium content to download if they give you their email address. Maybe you give them a little quiz that helps them figure out if they want to take a vacation in Maine or not, or if a particular product is right for them. Maybe you run a contest. Now, one thing I do want to say, when you capture someone's email, you do have to make sure that they're opting in to you sending them email. So the real benefit to capturing email is then you can use it as a marketing tool. But if you don't have an opt-in mechanism, then people don't opt in. You can't legally send them email. So you want to make sure you have a mechanism to opt in. But other ways we can engage users. We can send them to our social media pages where they can build their networks. We can encourage them to leave ratings and reviews. We can give them the option to like, share, and comment on content on our website. We can specifically ask their opinions. We can ask them to sign up for anything we want them to sign up for. But you should always find a way to at least engage with your users in one or two of these particular practices. Because if you engage with your users, you give them a reason to come back over time. And so people begin to value that engagement. So question to ask yourself here, are you actively engaging users? And in particular, are you capturing their email or some way to continue to interact with them? You also wanna think about how you surround your customer. So your website's a great thing, but one of the things that's interesting, we know businesses that engage in more than just developing their website tend to end up having more successful relationships with their customers that yield higher profitability over time. One of the reasons that they're able to do this is they can stay in the customer's field of presence because they surround the customer by more than just their website. So again, things like ratings and reviews can be helpful, but you could also try things like display advertising. So you could buy advertising from Google, you could develop a little ad about your business and you could get that ad to run on other people's websites. You could ask your customers to do some word of mouth advertising for you. You know, in one of my businesses here in Maine, about every other month, we send out an email to customers and we say, hey, if you love our products, tell 10 friends. Now the vast majority don't do it, but the few percent that do do it have introduced us over time to tens of thousands of people. So don't be afraid to ask people who are your fans to spread the word about you. Similarly, if you are trolling your own social media and you see someone is always saying really great things about you, reach out to that person and connect with them. They could end up being an influencer or an opinion leader. And maybe you can find a way, for example, to have that person sit on some sort of customer advisory board or team where they feel like they're helping you in your customer-centric decision-making, but they're also out spreading the good word about you in the social sphere. And then there are a whole host of other tools that you can use. For example, if you buy paid advertising through Google, there's an integration module with Facebook where you can do retargeting. We probably have all witnessed retargeting if we've been in social media, where we go online and we do a search, I won't gonna take a trip to Italy, and I land on Delta's website from my Google search, and then I go to social media, and sure enough, I get served an ad from Delta. This is an example of retargeting. For some consumers, it's creepy and they don't like it, but the reason we do it is it works. So one of the things we know about retargeting, it can improve conversion rates two to three times compared to with no retargeting. So retargeting can be a wonderful tool to also keep our message in front of our customers. So again, question we're going to try to answer here. Do we have a plan to surround our customers to maximize our reach and our awareness? Now, if you're just starting out, I don't want you to try to do all these things. 
because if you try to do too many things, you're not going to get good at a few things. And it's getting good at a few things that really makes a difference in web strategy. If you're already more of an expert and you're doing a couple of these things, I'd ask you to think about, well, is there a category that you're not doing that you could try? So the most important thing about all of this and these 15 concepts we're walking through is I want you to be generally aware of all of them and try to do something related to all of them, but don't think you have to do everything that's on these slides. I've tried to pack the slides so that you have lots of things to think about. And the other interesting thing, you don't need to be a total expert to do a lot of these things. You know, this is the great thing about online search these days. In YouTube, you can Google display advertising. How does it work? And you can watch two YouTube videos and get a good understanding of how to try it in a very short span of time. So I've tried to pick concepts that are ones where you're not going to have to go back to a university and get an education. You can learn a lot of this stuff on your own, either through the tools provided by Google or in channels like YouTube. All right, let's talk a little bit about web content strategy. We want to make sure that we have a strategy, no matter how basic it is to the development of web content. I say this because in my consulting practice, when I meet with businesses that don't have a content strategy for their website, they tend to not ever do anything to evolve their web content. Even businesses that agree to review the content once every six months and change it if it needs to, do a better job than those that don't have a strategy at all. So it's important to have some frame to think about content. So some first sort of major principles of web content strategy, if part of the strategy is it requires that you update things and you gotta figure out with what frequency we update them. Another part of the strategy, the content you create needs to be unique. So you have to figure out what your value proposition What's your unique selling proposition? Often I find businesses are great at sales strategy. So when you wanna to talk to them about, here's how you sell your product, you understand your unique selling proposition and all the ways in which you can talk about that value you're creating. Those same businesses often struggle applying that thinking to their website. So it's important to think about your website as an extension of all of your selling activities. So any unique selling propositions you have need to come through in your website as well. You also need to understand content creation. So who are you making the content for and who's doing that creation? I often, in my consulting practice, encourage people to think about the development of personas. So who are the people that come to your website? Who are your customers? What do they look and feel like demographically, psychographically, geographically? Are you targeting, you know, and, and I often go through a naming exercise. You know, we got the Marys. These are women who are the age 45 plus. They're working a full-time job and they also do a lot of yoga. And then we got the Janes. These are the women who are slightly younger, just starting out in their careers, but they also do yoga. So the overlap for me to think about is what do they value in terms of their yogi lifestyle and how might I learn some lesson about how I can adapt a marketing message that would be appealing to someone who does yoga. So personas are a great way, particularly if you don't have a lot of time to gather a lot of customer profile information. I know in my two small businesses, we don't spend a ton of time going out and collecting too much demographic, psychographic, and behavior information. Instead, we talk to our customers and then we try to build these personas. Premium content can also be helpful. So again, having an about us page, making sure you have an FAQ that is a generally helpful FAQ. So again, I go out to my customers and say, what are your most urgent questions, and then those are the ones I put on the FAQ page. Having video, in just a minute, we're gonna talk a little bit more about video, but video is another way that you could really strengthen your content strategy. You wanna make sure that you write compelling copy and use the right language. So this is a concept that I think also is tough sometimes. You wanna make sure the writing on your website is at the audience's literacy level. Now, for the average American, that literacy level is eighth grade. And so we don't need to debate 
what we need to change in the education system, what we need to think about is how then do I write to a level that the average person can understand? And how do I do it in such a way that I don't feel like it's too condescending to someone who might have a higher literacy level? So this often takes some practice. One of the interesting things, again, there are lots of tools that can help us online. If you're familiar with the site Grammarly.com, one of the things I love about Grammarly, I put all my website content in it. Why? Because it prunes excessive words, it makes my content really direct, really crisp. And the other thing that I can do is I can adjust somewhat for literacy level. So, you know, I can set certain features to Grammarly that say, okay, if I've used any words that are difficult to comprehend, change them to words that are easier to comprehend. So there are tools out there that can allow us. You know, the other thing you can do is you can literally cut and paste a block of content into the Google search engine and just do it with the phrase literacy level and it will tell you what the average literacy level is. So there are lots of tools out there to help us with this. Again, don't forget expertise, authority, and trustworthiness in search engine optimization. We'll talk about those in a minute. Integrate with social media and allow for user-generated content. Again, Google loves it when we allow for commenting, ratings, and reviews because it gives a lot of credibility to that user-generated content. Measure and track performance and try to create value, excitement, engagement. So for this concept, we're trying to answer the question, do you have an effective overall content strategy? Next, how do we build better sites? Well, people love white space. Why? Because when we pack a website with too much text, it looks like a lot of reading and people don't like reading. So one of the downfalls of websites is we cram them full of words. In fact, when I look at some of these lecture slides I've created for you, I have crammed them full of words. I'm actually not following my own best advice, but I'm doing it because I only have a few number of slides in an hour to get through a lot of content. But if I were moving this into cyberspace, I would definitely do testing to figure out what's the best balance of how much white space I should have to text. You wanna make sure your navigation is simple. We often overcomplicate navigation. People can't figure out how to use it. Again, you need about us and contact us information because these are important for people to know not only what you're about, who you're about, but how to get in touch with you. You always wanna make sure your website has some sort of call to action or sign up. So, you know, one of the things that I really dislike when someone comes in my consulting practice, you know, I once was working with a restaurant and they were like, we don't get any customers from our website. And I went and looked at the website and I'm like, well, yes, you have no call to action. There's no way to make a reservation. There's no way to contact you. So it's great that people can find out where you are because there's a little Google map, but how do you know if there's no way or call to action to engage with those users on your website. You wanna make sure that you have search that's functional. You wanna make sure your site's mobile responsive, and we're gonna get into that in just a minute. You wanna have great images, a great and readable web font. Again, you want the content to be engaging some way. You wanna use video integration. So question for this concept is, have you integrated best practices guidelines into your website? If you look at this list and you go, oh, I have a lot of work to do, don't think you have to change all these things overnight. Pick one that's manageable. Maybe you can add some better images or maybe you can create a welcome video that you make on your cell phone and then you just upload it to your website. So if you already have a website that you think's doing a good job, then I would just use this list as a way to go through and check and go, okay, is my navigation simple? Do I have these pages? Do I have a call to action? So make these lists work effectively for you based on where you are today. Let's talk a little bit about mobile responsiveness. So one of the interesting things, the number of people doing search and accessing websites on mobile is now three to four times that of desktop. So in fact, the desktop is going the way of the dodo. So most consumers are gonna interact with your website on their mobile phone. The challenge is most of us design websites for the desktop. 
So I want us all to start to reframe our thinking about what's called mobile first design. So although it's easier in some ways to design a website for desktop, you want to make sure that what you design is fully mobile responsive. And some things to think about for mobile responsiveness, you want to not have people do too much reading. So if you have a page that has a lot of content, maybe you only give people the first two paragraphs and then you give them an option to click a link to download the rest of the content into a PDF or other file for them to read later. You want to make sure you have large tap targets. So when people have to tap something on the site to navigate or to take an action like click to call, you want to make sure that those targets are not so small that people can't actually tap them and get them to work. You want to make sure you've optimized fonts. So, you know, another challenge we often have is our web fonts and responsive design get so small that we have to go in and make some adjustments. You wanna make it easy to see the desktop version if you want. You wanna make it easy to click to call you by using auto detection of phone number. And as a general rule of thumb, you wanna take out all content that's not necessary. A lot of people think every page I have in my desktop or tablet site needs to be found on my mobile site. And in many cases, that's not true. Now, if you are not an expert in search engine optimization, before you go taking pages out, you want to try to talk to someone who is. Because the other downside is sometimes we remove content that's actually really important in our search strategy. And what we don't want to do is inadvertently negatively impact our search rankings. Okay, concept 11, use video whenever and wherever you can. As you'll see in this graphic from HubSpot, regardless of age demographic, Video is far preferred over written content that we create, like blogs and articles. And interestingly, although users prefer video, they don't expect it to be perfect. There's a study that came out last year, and one of the things that was interesting, a website visitor is three times more critical of a written piece of content with spelling mistakes in it than a video where people are going, um, I didn't mean to say that. Oops. I mean, so it's interesting. We often shy away from video because we think it needs to be totally perfect when the reality is it doesn't need to be totally perfect. And the great news, again, this device has made it really easy to make a video. So most mobile phones now have made it simple so we can upload and share videos to YouTube and these other social media channels. Well, those same videos we can use on our website. So if you're curious about how to integrate video, let's go back and maybe use the restaurant example. Maybe you make a welcome video where if you're the owner of the restaurant or the manager, you just welcome customers and it's a 60 second welcome to the restaurant. Maybe on the menu page, you make a video of people enjoying the food. And this is something you can stage. You can get some of your employees to sit down like their customers and just serve some food and stage a little video. You know, maybe if you're selling a product, you make a video of someone holding the product up and explaining how it's used. So video is great because it's engaging. We know that video increases engagement. We also know, according to Google Analytics, video improves conversion. And so one question to think about, do you have video on your current website? And if you don't, is there some simple video you could make to help improve the website? Let's talk about social media now. When I talk about social media, I mean the collection of platforms from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram to YouTube to Pinterest to TikTok to Reddit, et cetera, et cetera. So the interesting thing about social media, most consumers don't expect that you're going to be in all those channels. But if your customers, for example, are over the age of 45, they probably expect you're going to be in Facebook. If your customers are mostly between the ages of 18 and 34, they probably expect you're going to be an Instagram. So you got to know a little bit about your customers to figure out which social media platforms are going to work best for you, particularly if you can't be in all of them. So social media is great. It builds brand awareness. It increases traffic. It helps you develop customer relationships that lead to loyalty. It can boost your performance in 
search engine ranking pages. So it can boost where people find you in Google and Bing. It improves trustworthiness, et cetera. The one issue with social media is often it takes a long time to update all of these platforms. So you've got to find the minimum number that work for you and the minimum frequency with which you update them. Sometimes I meet with businesses and they move their entire online marketing function to just social media. And this is a mistake. And one of the reasons it's a mistake is often social media cannot be directly contributed to increase conversion rate or sales. So it's great to build brand awareness, but often social media by itself will not improve sales. You still have to get people back to your site. So another thing to think about is how does your site link out to your social media platforms, but then how do you use social media to get people to make the return visit and come back to the site occasionally? So social media, for example, if you're running a special contest to try to recruit email addresses, promote the contest on social media, but don't get tempted to use that Facebook module that allows you to run the contest on Facebook. Why? because you have an opportunity to send people back to your site. And if the contest is a good one, people will click the link and make the journey. So it's good to get people back to your site when you can. So are you actively using social media? And if you are, can you add some sort of linking mechanism to go back and forth between website and media platform? Ratings and reviews. You should be encouraging and collecting ratings and reviews frequently. So you want to engage with your customers and I want you to post them all, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The important thing is have response mechanisms. If someone leaves you a good review, thank them for leaving you a good review. If someone is a frequent customer and you know it and they leave you a good review, thank them and tell them you look forward to greeting them again when they return. If someone leaves you a bad or ugly review, find a way to do service recovery. Let them know here's the way you can get in touch with us because we want to make the situation right. Now, this could take a little bit of time. This to me is more important than time spent in social media. Why? The American Marketing Association did a study last year and one of the things they found is that users who visit your website trust your customer ratings and reviews nine times more than the information the company provides. So everything you say about yourself, people trust the things your customers say about you nine times more. Ratings and reviews can become one of the most powerful mechanisms to build your online web presence. Now, interestingly, that same study showed that when you only post good reviews, people believe you're hiding something. So this is why it's good to occasionally have a not so great review. And then the other thing we know about service recovery, just like in the field of marketing, if you've done something and someone gives you a bad review, but you have a good visible service recovery, you're just as likely to recapture that customer as if they had a good experience to start. So don't shy away from the bad and ugly reviews. Now there is some things I will say to you. For example, if you have three ugly reviews, you might wanna space them out. So there's just not a block of three ugly reviews. So you do have to use some intuition about the way in which you might display them, but it is important to display them all. And again, there are a whole bunch of third-party services out there. I use one for my business here in Maine called Trustpilot. And Trustpilot automatically goes out and collects the reviews. It manages them for me. And it's also a third party. So to the search engines, my reviews are now considered a legitimate bit of content for my credibility because I have a third party collecting them. I'm not doing it myself. And I think the service costs me like $45 a month. So it's a small investment, but it's an investment worth making. Okay, also you wanna make sure you're optimizing search. So we could spend an entire session talking about search engine optimization. I just want to cover a few of the highlights of SEO and encourage you, if you're not already engaging in search engine optimization, to think about this is an area where you at least once a quarter 
want to seek some outside help to get someone to do a review of your site. Because interestingly, search engine optimization is another really important way for people to discover you through organic search. Now, if your website is built on a platform, for example, like WordPress, the great news when you use a site builder like WordPress is your pages are automatically SEO enabled. And so a lot of the search engine optimization happens on its own. But if for whatever reason you developed your own site using ASP.net or one of the other development platforms, you have to think about search engine optimization. So you want to make sure you use keywords and what are called metadata. So on the code of the website, metadata very briefly is just the part of the page that says this is the title. This is the description of the page. This is the content of the page. You want to make sure that in that data that's invisible to consumers, but is the data that programs the web page, that you have used your most important keywords. So if your website is all about bottled water that comes from the state of Maine, you got to make sure you get the terms bottled water and state of Maine in there. It's important to use keywords more than once which we call keyword density, but don't overdo it. So one of the ways to kill your search engine rankings is for you to, for example, create content that's like, in the state of Maine, I sold bottled water because bottled water is the best bottled water product that a customer could want when they're drinking bottled water. That's not gonna be good content for users, and it's definitely not gonna be good content for the search engines when they try to figure out how to rank you. So. Make sure your keywords are used a reasonable amount of time. Don't forget to put headers on pages. Another way that we make content more readable is we break it into chunks or smaller paragraphs. And each one of those paragraphs should have a header because that's another way in which we can get some keywords. All of our images should be tagged. So if you have an image of a cat, make sure whoever does your web programming puts a keyword cat, an image tag on that image. It's another way for search engines to find you. Again, if you're working with a platform like WordPress, it automatically tags your images. So the good news is if you're using one of these programs, you often don't have to think about some of this stuff. Manage page load time. So if it takes too long to load a page, Google is going to push you down in the rankings. If you have duplicative content, they're also going to penalize you. Google hates it when you have five pages on a website that all say the same thing. They don't think that's a good consumer experience. So if you have a page that says something and then you're writing a new page because maybe you're introducing a new feature, consider going back and reasonably editing the original page. So don't think you should be proliferating pages and Again, Google gives you lots of credit for mobile responsiveness. If your site looks great in mobile and people are using it and they're not just visiting and leaving because they can't navigate or they can't tap or they can't read, then Google gives you credit for being mobily responsive. And remember about links and videos because Google, again, loves it when you use video content and they love it when they see people reasonably linking in and out of their website, even if it's to their own social media pages. So this question I often say, am I optimizing my site for search? And then the last concept is around content marketing. So marketing enables you to increase and boost your brand visibility, leading to awareness and recognition. It helps establish EAT. It builds customer relationships. It supports all the search marketing functions. You know, it also helps you keep current and it helps with reputation management. So you've got to figure out the ways that you're marketing your content. You know, I went to a restaurant in New York once and on my way out the door, when they gave me my check, they also gave me a thank you card and they personalized it. Dear Mr. Billadoo, thank you for dining with us tonight. Keep in touch by visiting our website. And you know what? I was so interested in the card, I went and visited the website, and then they did exactly what I'm telling you to do. They had this compelling way where I could win a gift certificate for $25 if I entered my email address. So I entered my email address and opted in. That's one way to promote your content. There are tons of ways to promote your content, but it's important to think about how you're gonna do that. So we can certainly rely on online tools like search engine optimization, 
but also think about all the other ways that we might be able to promote our content. All right, my closing thoughts before I take questions. You should review your website frequently and only you can decide what frequency is right for you. Again, in my businesses, we do one business once a month, we do the other one every quarter or other quarter. You should have a plan. So, you know, good digital marketing and website marketing is about iteration and testing. Have a plan. This also couples with experiment often. We should be trying things and figuring out what works and expand the things that work. And if things don't work, try something else. Try to do something new. When you look at your website, you know, another thing that I love to do is troll the competition. I look at my website and I look at my competitors' websites and I go, oh, look at what these people are doing over here. I could try something similar. It breaks me out of my own vein of thinking to trying something new. And then most importantly, remember your users. You want to make sure that all the things you're doing is going to serve your online audience well. So your decision should be based on what your customers tell you, not what you yourself would prefer. All right, I'm gonna stop screen sharing and take questions. So far we have no questions and that is kind of remarkable because the amount of content you just went through is mind blowing. It was very impressive. I took substantial amounts of notes <laughs> for the SBDC to do. Um, is there any questions? I don't want to, I want to give you guys a chance to think about it for a second. Um, we're happy to attempt to answer any of your, any of your specific questions that you may have gotten from here. So I will be sending a follow-up email out to all of you either later today or tomorrow. Um, it'll have a recording of the seminar as well as um, the slides that Professor Bill do. Right? Did I say that right? I keep think I keep screwing it up. But um, so somebody's looking for suggestions on how to incorporate video into website for a retail store. Yes. So for a retail store. Um, you have a really great opportunity. You could actually have one of your sales associates shop the store. So one of the things that I've seen quite well, you know, let's say it's in the springtime and you have new spring arrivals and in the retail store, let's just say you sell clothing. You could literally have someone with their cell phone follow one of the sales associates around to say, we're so excited for the new spring arrivals. Here are a few things we'd like to highlight for you this new dress came in, this new scarf came in, this new whatever came in. And so I think those virtual tours can be really helpful. The other thing is if you have some customers who are loyalist, you could get your customers to give their reviews of products on video. So this is another one of the things that I really, really love when people do. You know, in my business here in Maine, we have customers make video testimonials for us and post them to Facebook. Um, we do that only because we have good relationships with our customers and even if they're bad, we have an active customer service process. But in a retail shop, it might be interesting if you have a few frequent buyers to see if they'd be willing to make a video or two. And then my third suggestion would be having some sort of welcome from the manager or owner of the shop you know, welcome today, we're glad you're here. Here's our philosophy for the type of stuff we sell. Here's how we got interested in it. Try to keep it short. I mean, the interesting thing about videos like the ones I'm describing, 60 to 90 seconds is the sort of sweet spot. I would add, a video gives you a really good opportunity to show your consumers, your customers, what you're doing in response to COVID to make sure that you're keeping them safe. There's a really amazing opportunity to show, you know, when you walk in the store, it's gonna be a little bit different we're gonna ask you to sanitize your hands or wear a mask or something like that. That really puts some consumers at ease so that they do feel comfortable joining, you know, finally going back to shopping. I know that I'm, I mean, I'm dying to get out of here. So yes. um, anytime I can feel more comfortable in this new environment, I mean, video is an excellent way to show that you're really legitimately following through. Yep. So there's a question about cost to hire mm -hmm. someone. That really depends. I mean, you can hire someone for not much money to spend a lot of money. One of the things that I generally do when I hire consultants, and I've worked with lots of people um, as consultants to my own company in this area, 
I generally start by making the minimum list of things I hope to achieve. And I start with working with someone local. You know, I have found there are lots of people you can work with online. They don't basically, sometimes they, they don't provide you a cost savings. But on the flip side, if we look at some of the things that have happened since the pandemic because of the gig economy, you know, the other day I hired some content writers, I think from Indonesia, and they did a fantastic job for me. And I just went out and on Freelancer put out a bid and I just to test it out to see how it worked and I accepted a bid. It was low cost and so it was a little test to see if we could actually make this content strategy work. So, um, you know, I have worked locally with IBEC Creative. Um, they sometimes, depending on the work, they can be expensive, but they've always done such great work for me that it's been worth the cost. So, but a lot of it, I think, has to depend on where you want to start, what work you want to work with. The other thing I would encourage you to do is also, if you have some real startup questions, take advantage of counseling at the SBDC. I mean, I've had many businesses say to me, you know, I learned about these three great things that got me going by talking to a business counselor at the SBDC. I bet Creative is a local online marketing firm uh, here in Southern Maine. So if you're in the state of Maine, um, they're, they've been a great help to me in my own businesses in the past. So, but, you know, obviously take advantage of the low cost or free resources first. Uh, I've also had a couple people say to me they've had success going to SCORE and asking to speak to a retired executive specifically that worked in digital marketing. And I know the Chamber of Commerce also has some help and support resources for early digital marketing efforts. So I, I think there's some stuff out there. Um, so question about I don't have, uh, literally don't have hours, it's by chance or appointment. I would make sure it says that in your Google profile if you can, because I, I think it's, you know, if that's the true way in which people can experience your business, I think that's perfect as long as people know to experience your business. What I think sometimes frustrates people is you show up at a place and it says it's by chance, but some rating and review said, oh, I went there on the afternoon and Google goes, oh, they're open every afternoon. And then it just assumes it's between one and five. And so you want to make sure if there's misinformation in your Google profile that you update anything that isn't true. And, and I think it's perfectly legit to say, you know, we see people by chance and here's the way to get in touch with us. I would suggest strongly that you do that. I had um, recently, I went to go get pellets for my pellet stove and the place that I get them is a local small, small business. And they had regular hours stated. So I arranged to get a truck. I did all this stuff. We got there, they were closed with a sign on the door that said by appointment only. And I was so frustrated. So I think that the, you have to consider your customers here and the fact that they may show up with a truck organizing all that to not get the pellets that I needed. <laughs> so, uh, oh, go ahead. No, 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 I'm all done. So um, I'm more familiar with WordPress than I am with Wix in terms of its SEO capability. Um, like WordPress, I believe it does have some built-in SEO in it. Um, you know, one of the things I like about Wix, it's a little more flexible to work with, I find, but WordPress has a few more integrations with, for example, e-commerce platforms like Shopify and customer um, membership platforms like Recharge. So, you know, we ended up being a WordPress shop largely because we made the decision first to be a Shopify shop. And so Shopify sort of dictated WordPress because they have such a strong relationship with one another. But Wix is, you know, I have many students who have design their startup businesses in Wix and they love how easy and fluid it is to use. I think if you go on their website, you should be able to poke around to see what uh, SEO they have. I know they have some, but I'm not familiar enough to be able to tell you how it compares to WordPress. So WordPress is, hold on and I will tell you. I get them confused too. So one of them is one you would have a self-hosted website on and WordPress, a different version is one where it's free, but it, they give you certain templates and certain restrictions in building it. And if yes. you're just starting out, you're gonna want 
I think it's wordpress.com. So, yes, wordpress.com is the place that I would start. So we do have a question about, um, do you have a good source of privacy policy or ter and terms and conditions, condition templates, I'm sorry, for an e-commerce store? Um, yes, but one thing that I'm going to say, uh, and this is also where sometimes the SBDC can be helpful, um, it's definitely worth, even if you use a template, having someone do one quick legal review uh, to make sure the specifics of your business are um, covered. You know, one of the things that I think is often interesting about terms and conditions of use and privacy, like so many things are specific to what you do that sometimes when you use one of these standardized templates, you're actually not fully covering yourself. So um, I will include uh, some links to some websites. I'll send them to Jennifer today that I think have done a great job in terms of privacy policy, in terms of use. These are websites I often use as a reference myself. But for my own sites, I have my attorneys once a year or once every 18 months spend 15 minutes just looking at them to make sure they're okay. So somebody um, is looking for some suggestions on selling services via digital methods rather than just products, which we've talked, we always yep. end up talking about products a lot. Yep. Um, any thoughts on that? And, so, oh, and they're ahead. talking, um, it's all, they're also, we've also focused on consumers, but maybe this, they sell pro services to businesses. Can yep. you kind of think about that? So biz to biz a lot of these same things apply. I mean, I think ratings or reviews are important. And biz to biz, I think you have a couple of additional opportunities that are great. Uh, one, you can get some customer testimonials. And again, if you can get your customers to do a video testimonial, even more powerful. But second, you should be thinking about, you have an opportunity to do what we call a white paper. So could you create a sort of best practices Example, so let's just say you're selling advertising services and you're really good at web design. Maybe you create your best practices white paper around web design, which just highlights here are the five things that we think every website needs and you make it downloadable and it becomes a recruitment tool. Um, the other thing I think that you have with services is the people providing the services can make short videos where they talk about what they do. And, you know, the other day I was talking to a client of mine and they are in nutritional coaching. So they do lifestyle coaching. And the funniest thing, I'm like, well, why don't you just do a mock coaching session? You know, video a mock coaching session because then people will see what the coaching is like. And they sat down and did it and they were like, oh my God, that was a brilliant idea. Like that answers our top 25 questions that we get in this 90 second video and shows people that we're smart and what our expertise is and how we interact. And so I think you have an opportunity again to say, maybe you're in a shop where you have three consultants offering services, like make a person a subject matter expert in a different area and then do three videos. Um, the other thing that I will say is important if it's services, social media platform of choice really should be LinkedIn. So I, I think, again, if you're doing business to business, you can dial down the Instagram and the, the Twitter and the et cetera, more consumer-based social media platforms, but really think about developing a presence on LinkedIn. One of the things I love about LinkedIn, you can post little blog posts or and they can be micro blogs that are the size of Twitter, but try to start to build a network on LinkedIn and use that as a network to leverage. So related to that, do you have any suggestions for somebody that's in like a medical office or veterinary medical or medicine um, related to video content? So in a medical office related to video content, I think you can talk about the different conditions you treat, the different expertise you have. There, I think you have to be a little more careful because you probably don't wanna mock up what it's like to see the patient-doctor interaction because there are HIPAA and privacy concerns. So you wanna be sensitive to all of that. But that doesn't mean you couldn't have a doctor, you know, say, hi, I'm Dr. Billadu, my expertise is allergies. And right now, all sorts of things are blooming because of the humidity. Here's a way in which you can 
be less concerned about your sniffle because you know it's an allergy and not something more severe. And I could, you know, give my three sound bites about that. Um, I also think sometimes I have seen video content in the past in medical situations where a patient care coordinator has done a welcome online to say, welcome, when you come to our practice, the first thing you can expect is the person at the front desk will greet you and they just walk you through the experience to reduce patient anxiety prior to going. So that can be sort of an extension of customer service to help people anticipate what's going to happen when they arrive in the office. I think we've gotten through all of the questions. Am I wrong? If there's any last minute questions, use the chat very quickly. See. And I think we might be good to go. I'm so, so grateful that you took the time to join us today. Um, I know that this is a topic that is so, so prevalent in all of our minds right now. And this was, I mean, truly so informative. So thank you so much for your time.